Hello and welcome to the Adobe Twitch channel. My name is Terry White, Worldwide Design and Photography Evangelist for Adobe, and it's my pleasure to stream to you live here at twitch.tv slash adobe for the next two hours. This is going to be a two-hour marathon. This is going to be a, a two-hour thing on Lightroom. Uh, this is the final two parts, um, so like a two-hour season finale of my uh, Creative Cloud Learning Stream Introduction to Lightroom CC Parts 7 and 8. And if you're a little confused by that, you know, why are we doing two parts today? It's because normally we'd be doing Part 7 in an hour. So we'd be doing it at 11 a.m. Eastern. But because my Friday stream got preempted by a special event here on Twitch, uh, I'm going to do both parts today. So we're going to do Parts 7 and 8 today. And it'll just be two hours of Lightroom instead of one hour uh, Lightroom today and one hour Lightroom Friday. And then I'll be back on again on next Tuesday with something new that I haven't figured out what that new thing is going to be yet. But we'll be doing something. Maybe another learning stream on another product. So we've done Photoshop. We're finishing up Lightroom. I don't know. Maybe Muse. Maybe InDesign. Maybe Illustrator. You never know. All right. So with that said, um, if you're watching the replay or the video on demand, if you're watching the replay on my YouTube channel or the video on demand at twitch.tv slash adobe slash profile, uh, that's where all the replays of our Twitch streams are located um, or the video on demands. And if you're watching that, meaning this is not live for you, then know that this is a live show that I do normally every Tuesday and Friday from 10 a.m. Eastern till noon. Um, and again, the only day or uh, it'll be preempted this Friday I will not be on but other than that I am usually on Tuesdays and Fridays 10 a.m. till noon and this is once again wrapping up the Lightroom learning stream uh, introduction to Lightroom parts 7 and 8 so we're going to deal with the rest of the modules today that we haven't dealt with and then uh, since I can just run a continuous it'll just be one continuous talk about Lightroom with all the remaining modules, and of course we'll do the second part, uh, part eight, which is all about output. I even had someone, I think, tweet or Facebook to me asking if uh, I was going to cover outputting files for print, and I'm absolutely going to be doing that. Now, if you, again, once again, if you are watching this as a video on demand, uh, since this is a live show that happened uh, Tuesday, May 24th at 10 a.m., uh, that means that there are people live in the chat, and I will be addressing them like this. I'll be looking over at my chat window, and I'll say uh, things like, um, hello to no more fun. <laughs> hello, Kevin. Uh, let's see, what else? Is there anyone else in here? Bleary. Uh, 4 o'clock four o'clock p.m. Okay, coffee as well. Great. Uh, I thought it was going to be 4 o'clock a.m. That would be rough, watching the stream at 4 o'clock a.m., but p.m. is not bad. So whatever time it is in your time zone, thanks for joining me here for this last two parts of Introduction to Lightroom CC. Now, it doesn't mean we won't be doing Lightroom again in the future, but this will conclude our Lightroom learning stream. Uh, and hey, StarCrunch uh, and Victoria, my great moderators for today, and Gizcult. Um, and let's see. I think I got everybody. If I didn't get you, hello. All right, so let's uh, let me go ahead and get Lightroom up on the screen here, and then that way we can um, jump over and take a look at where we're going to start today. We're going to start in an interesting place. Um, this is not the first part of this. Is this little first little part is not actually part of the listed things that I had as topics, but it's important and it's a question that comes up all the time anyway. So I'd rather go ahead and knock it out, and uh, that way you guys will be able to see what's going on. Okay. So, if you've been following along on this stream, you know that I started off uh, with a brand new empty catalog for parts one through five. So, we started off with a brand new catalog created from scratch. We imported images into it. We massaged those images as far as collections and folders and metadata and keywords and things like that. Uh, we talked about Lightroom Mobile. We did all of that. Oh, I'm sorry, we did uh, everything except for Lightroom Mobile. We did all of that in that um, uh, new catalog that we created from scratch. Then, last stream, when we talked about Lightroom Mobile, I switched over to my regular catalog that I use personally every day. And we're in that catalog right now. Um, however, there were some things that we had done in that other catalog 
that like some images remember the ones we did of gina um randy and there was one more folder i can't remember what it was but remember those images that we started with well they're not necessarily in this catalog well at least not the way they were in that catalog so i love to bring those in now, what people are tempted to do is, especially if they're working with multiple catalogs, is they're tempted to just do another import. Click import, find the folder of images, bring them in again. But there's one caveat if you do it that way. If you just import the images again from another catalog as a folder of images, then what you will probably be missing is all the work that you did in Lightroom. In other words, you'll be missing any adjustments you made, that weren't saved to the actual metadata of the files. You'll be missing any ratings, rankings, flags, and all that stuff won't come over if you just import it again as another folder of images. However, Lightroom does have the ability to import from a catalog, and that way you will be bringing over everything that you did, all the work you did in the other catalog. So it just depends on what you want. If all I wanted was the images and I didn't care about the adjustments, I didn't care about any organization, metadata, or any of that, fine. Click the import button down here on the left, go find that same Gina folder, bring her images in, and I don't have to think about it. But if I want to bring over all the stuff that I did, then I won't click that button. Instead, I'll go over to the file menu and I'll choose import from another catalog. So the import from another catalog is the way that you would bring images over from a different catalog, or if you're trying to combine multiple catalogs into one. So another reason why this comes up is because since Lightroom Mobile only works with one catalog at a time, and most people, especially people that have been using Lightroom for years and years and years, probably have multiple catalogs, and therefore, um, so I see a question right off the bat. When did they do that? If you're talking about this feature, this feature has been here for years. <laughs> so I don't know. I uh, just found the homepage for Lightroom in a browser. That's awesome. Yep. That's, oh, if you're talking about that feature, that's been here since Lightroom mobile, like at least a year. So that's been here a while as well. Um, but anyway, the import from another catalog is a feature that's been around for years. And this is the way you would combine catalogs into one. Now, keep in mind, if I say import from another catalog, it doesn't do anything to that other catalog. That other catalog will still exist as if you'd never touched it. But this would be, the, would be the way to bring it all together into one catalog if you've got multiple catalogs sitting around out there and you say, you know what, from here on out, I'm going to do what Terry's doing. I'm just going to use one catalog for everything. And I do use one catalog pretty much for everything. All right, so let's go ahead and do an import from catalog. And uh, I had already gone to this folder before, but it was in my pictures folder and it was in a um, catalog called TWP for Terry White Photography dash Twitch. So this is the one we created from scratch. And I want to bring over all the stuff that we did in that catalog. Now, when I go ahead and, um, okay, when I go ahead and choose that, it will um, prompt me with the ability to, and by the way, I norm, normally by default, it has the preview turned off. So this is the way the window would look by default. It's gonna show you all the folders that you brought in. So the, these were all the folders that, most of these I brought in for that last demo on, on the develop module. But then it's gonna show me the other folders of my images that I brought in as well. So I can say, don't bring in everything, let me pick and choose, or bring in everything. Now you might notice that in the Randy and Mask training folder, there's a minus symbol there. Because Why is that one a minus and all the rest are checks? The reason that that's a minus is because, remember, these are images that I've already used and probably shot in my existing catalog. So in that particular folder, when I see a minus like that, it's a dead giveaway that some of those images already exist in this catalog. So I, it's, in other words, it's not gonna let me bring in duplicates. If they already exist in this catalog, it's not gonna let me bring them in again. So I'm just gonna uncheck that folder because I don't really need it anyway, and plus I've already brought those in. Now I can go ahead and uncheck them all, and I can say I just want the Gina ones, and I just want the ones that we shot tethered, and that's it. Um, I don't even need the Auckland ones because I probably already have them in a different folder anyway. 
Okay, so now that I've got that in place, then the next thing is, how do you want file handling to happen? Do you want to copy the new photos to a new location or just add them? And I just want to add them. I don't. They're already in the, in the folders where I want them to be. I don't want it copying anything. I don't want to duplicate anything. Well, uh, you changed uh, existing photos to that are in the catalog. What do you want to happen? Do you want to replace those? Metadata and develop settings only. Metadata, develop settings, and negative files. Um, so what that's saying is that there are two, at least two photos, probably in the Gina folder, that uh, ex already exist in this catalog, and it's asking me, what do you want to do with those? And I'm going to just say, do nothing. Because if they already exist, then I've already done what I want to do to them in this particular catalog. If not, you can say, just bring over the metadata and develop settings from the other one, if you think that that one's more current. Or bring it all over, if you think that that's more current. All right, so, and I can show a preview, which is uh, going to show me exactly which ones are coming over from each folder. And even here, I can pick off or check the ones that I don't want. And, for example, if I did, if I had just done another import from the, the Gina folder, then I wouldn't get this virtual copy. I wouldn't get this black and white virtual copy. I wouldn't get all the ones that have the uh, white balance adjusted. I wouldn't get anything. I wouldn't get any of these adjustments. I would just get the raw photos again. So that's why we're doing the import from a catalog is so I can bring over all this work that we already did in the previous sessions. All right, so now I'm going to just hit, go ahead and say import. And it should happen pretty quickly because the information's already there. It's already, it already knows uh, all the metadata. It already knows where the images are. I'm not copying anything. So it's just saying, okay, these images are now referenced in this catalog and the old one, the old Twitch one, with all the adjustments. So I saw some questions pop in. Uh, I wonder how you import photos from your camera. All you need to do, um, Mad Mips, is go back and watch the previous episodes. I, I think it was either episode one or two. We did that. We also did tethering. Uh, so if you just go watch the replays from the previous ones, we covered that. Uh, and if it's, if it's, if you're talking literally bring them in from the camera versus a card, we didn't cover that particular aspect of it, but all it would be is just plugging your USB cable in, plugging it into your computer and clicking import and Lightroom should see your camera and import and copy directly from the camera itself. And along those lines, since this is an intro class, most photographers don't import directly from the camera unless it's tethering, meaning you shot some images, you came back with your camera. Most of us don't plug in a cable and import them that way because for the simple reason, number one, a card reader is usually faster. So just take the memory card out, plug it into a reader. That's usually going to be faster than bringing them in from the USB cable. And the biggest reason is that it just drains the battery of the camera. In other words, while the, cam the camera has to stay on the entire time in, in an active mode, transferring all those images it's just a drain on the unnecessary drain on the battery so i'd rather use my battery for shooting not for transferring images those are the main reasons why most photographers don't connect the camera now in a pinch here's the example of when i have connected the camera when i have uh, used the camera that uses compact flash and i forget to bring my ca my card reader and i'm thinking oh no i can't bring them in and we always forget you can bring them in connect up the cable you can bring them in that way. So I only use that as a last resort. Otherwise, uh, I use a card reader or tethering uh, to bring them in live as I'm shooting, which we did cover. Okay, so now these images are here um, and they're brought in from the other catalog. And I just wanted to cover that as part of, uh, we might use some of these images in a minute anyway, but I wanted to cover that as part of um, merging catalogs together or bringing in images from a different catalog with all the adjustments and everything you've done to those images. And so the folders here now, the Gina J folder, um, if I scroll down here, there may be, I don't remember what we created. Uh, I was gonna say there may be a collection of those as well, the collections we did. And I can't remember what we did and didn't do anymore, but they should be here as well. So it should bring over all your images, your folders, uh, and any collections that 
you had created should come over as well. All right. So we've got this in place. Uh, I just want to check one more thing here. So I scroll through. Okay. Yeah, I think I got everything I wanted. Okay. Uh, you're welcome, Mad Mips. All right, next up. So, so far we've covered two of the modules, and we haven't covered every single thing about those two modules, but we've covered two of the modules in Lightroom from an intro standpoint. We've covered library from an intro standpoint. We've covered develop from an intro standpoint. But now we've got map, book, slideshow, print, and web. That's what we're going to cover for the remaining part of this first hour. Um, and it may bleed over into the second hour, but that's okay because we can do this all this, all at once. All right, so uh, let's talk about the map module. And again, this is not a good example because none of these images were uh, geotagged. But we can talk about that from a uh, from a standpoint of maybe you want to geotag them later. All right, so let's say that I want to go to we'll go to one of my travel um, travel collections. Now, these are images I have photographed and shot from all over the world. Uh, so there's some Paris, Egypt, London, London, Russia, um, um, Malmo, which is in Sweden, um, Denmark, 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 Amsterdam, New York City, San Francisco, South Africa, uh, let's see, Detroit, Australia, just images I've taken from all over the place, just everywhere. Now, if you see an image in your Lightroom collections or catalog, and that image has this little, what I call a signpost or flag, this little thing right here, what that means is that image right there, it just popped up, has GPS coordinates. Now, the, there's usually only one of two ways you're going to get that coming in. You're going to get the, get it coming in either with the image itself, because the image was shot with a camera that had a GPS on it, and the GPS was enabled and, and permission given. Um, and that's usually going to be from a smartphone or smart device, because your smartphone has a GPS in it, and you have the option, provided you've, you've accepted all the privacy warnings, that every time you shoot a photo with your smartphone camera, it will have the GPS coordinates in it. And, and Lightroom recognizes those coordinates. The other way is to use an external GPS like I have for my Nikon. Um, so I use a, 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 oh God, I can't think of the name of it. I can't think of the brand name, but I use a GPS that's uh, physically attached to the GPS port or the terminal port of my camera. And it's a separate little module. It's about that big. Plugs right into the camera. I switch it on when I want, plug it in when I want, and give it a few seconds to find satellites. And then once it does, as I'm shooting, those um, photos are being geotagged just like the ones in your smartphone. So those are the two ways that you're usually going to have GPS coordinates coming in. What if you didn't do it? What if you didn't um, have a camera that had it, like you're using a regular DSLR or a point and shoot, and it doesn't have GPS? Well, you can still plot where those images are taken manually in the map module. So you could do it either way. All right, so let's say, for example... Uh, that I want to pick one of these images and see where it will, see where I was when I took it. Uh, Statue of Liberty. That's probably a good one. Let's go ahead and click the little flag there. When I click, it will take me to that exact spot, almost in front of this boat, but exact spot where I was on a boat taking that picture. And even as I hover over that little spot, it shows me the picture that was taken. And this map is, uh, is supplied to us from Google. So it's Google Maps. And if I pan over, oh, there it is. I was right there shooting the Statue of Liberty, which is right there. Now, what? why do you need this? Like, what is this for? I love it. I actually, I, I'm a Geotag fan because to me, it's just exciting to just be able to use the technology to wherever I am in the world to know where my pictures were taken at. And the other reason I like it is because I get that question from time to time. Where was this taken? 
And so not only can I explain it, but I can actually show them on the map exactly where that where I was standing at the time I took that photo. So in this case, I was actually in the water on a boat, just like that boat. Um, and I was shooting that way and taking the picture of the Statue of Liberty from that spot. So if I go here to Amsterdam, click on that flag, it will jump over to Amsterdam and show me not only that photo that I took of the um, canal in Amsterdam, but if I see any other little flags there, it'll show me um, any other photos that were taken that I took nearby. So there's another one. I just walked over a couple blocks and took that one. And, and you can even see it as I hover over that photo, like I'm looking straight down the canal. This is the canal. I'm looking straight down. So it's usually pretty, pretty, very accurate. It's within like 20 feet usually. I think the uh, military doesn't let it be you know, very, you know, a hundred percent precise, but it's within several feet of where you were when you took the shot. Um, if you don't have that luxury of having that information in it, you can go up and do a search. You can search the map for a location or an address, and it'll take you to that spot and you can drag the photo to the spot to geotag it. Um, since these are all done, let's go find one that isn't done. Uh, let me go back out. Let me go back to the library module. Oops, I didn't want to search. And let's see if I can find one that isn't done. Uh, what do I've got here? All right. So none of these, these are portraits taken inside of a studio. So obviously I wouldn't have had my GPS turned on. Uh, no reason to. I know where my studio is. Uh, nothing in the red light district, nothing worth seeing on the stream. I'll put it that way. Um, let's see, just checking, 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 uh, for your after effects question, it's best to hit up, um, the, yep. Victoria put a blog, a post in there. It's best to hit up, uh, um, Adobe, um, Adobe care for tech support questions. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Oh, that may be the old one, the DI, yeah, the DI GPS. Yes, that is one of the ones I, uh, I use. So the DI GPS, thank you for reminding me of the brand. That is, uh, that is the company that makes my GPS is for my Nikon cameras. But anyway, back to the story. So let's say that I want to, I want to, uh, map these photos of Trevor where I took them. Well, there's no GPS data. I don't even have a smartphone shot to use. So I can go to map. And I can maybe type in the address, see if I can remember the address of my old studio. I think it's 1307 Allen Drive, Troy, Michigan. Let's see what happens. And yep, boom, there it is. And there are some other photos that I did geotag from the studio. So if I want to geotag all of these taken in my studio, I can select them all. I just clicked on one, held down the shift key and selected all the rest. And then I can just drag them right to that same spot. Actually, my studio was more like right there. And now it's setting the GPS coordinates to the metadata of all of those photos that I just popped in. Let's see what this one is. All right. And so actually we'll go to this one and now they're all there. I can go ahead and click my way through those photos that are now geotagged. And when we say that it puts it in the metadata, for example, if I click on one of those, there, that's the actual longitude and latitude that it's putting in and it does a, normally it does a reverse lookup and it did. And that reverse lookup, which you have to give Lightroom permission to do that one time. So when you first bring in a photo that has the GPS coordinates in it, like a smartphone shot, Lightroom will prompt you, do you want to turn on reverse lookup? And if you turn it on, it's just a one-time thing, then it will do this as well. It will populate based on the GPS information the exact city, state, country, ISO country code, so forth and so on. So this was done in Troy, Michigan at that exact location back in my old studio. So that is how to geotag photos that don't have GPS information. Now I'm going to give you one more tip, and this is the one I use all the time. Uh, let's say I'm out shooting with my DSLR or camera that doesn't have GPS, and I for or I forgot to bring my GPS. Well, remember, your smartphone has a GPS on it. So you get to this wonderful location. Here, let's go back to the travel photos. Let's get to a wonderful location. And 
let's go back out and look at them. All right, I get to this wonderful location, let's say here. All right, and I let's say it didn't have the GPS coordinates on it. What And I forgot my GPS. What I would do is take my phone out of my pocket and snap one photo, put my phone back in my pocket. And then I would shoot the rest with my DSLR. Because now, by using my phone to take that one picture, I've at least got the location mapped in one picture. So when I bring that photo back in, let's, let's say that this was the location I shot with the phone and the rest of these were shot with a DSLR in the same location, but they, and they're not the same location, by the way, but let's say, uh, or actually, yeah, they're not, but let's say they were, then what I could do is go to the map on this photo, the one shot with the phone. That's where I was actually standing right there. There's no gate, by the way. There's no fence. There's no anything. You fall, you fall to your death. That's pretty much it. There's nobody there to help you, warn you, whatever. You step too close to the edge, you're done. You're gone. Bye. That's it. So I was very careful to lay down on the ground and scooch up and stick my arms out and take that shot because I did not want to fall to my death. But anyway, let's say these other shots were shot in the same location. Once you bring in the smartphone shot and map it, then all you'd have to do is drag the remaining photos that you shot with your DSLR to the same exact spot. Or you put them around the spot wherever you want. And then it will map those shots. So even in the case where I forget or don't have my GPS attached, or I'm shooting in buildings where the GPS isn't picking up a good signal, I can still geotag them with my phone and then take one shot and then put my phone away, take the rest with the big camera, and then always come back to, to Lightroom and map them. Um, and so, for example, I said these weren't in the same spot because these are in this canyon. So these are down, I was down in these crevices, down in this canyon taking these shots. And if I click on these, you can see what they are. So these are actually underground. Um, and that's the parking lot. <laughs> All right. And this is Monument Valley. So this is another spot. Monument Valley, and I was standing, uh, yeah, right about there, taking pictures of those dunes. And it's just fun to be able to go back, especially for travel shots, and know exactly where you were when you took them. So, for example, we go to Egypt, and here I am. Let's see, I think the Sphinx is right there. It's got words over it, but there it is. So, there it is laying down on the ground, and I was right there, standing on that wall, taking that shot. And the Great Pyramids are right behind it. There's one. If I zoom back out, it'd probably be easier. Not that much. One, two, three. So the big, medium, small. And uh, I stood there and stood all around these pictures, or all around here taking these shots. So that is. Um, Tumbleweed, yeah, that's an old trick I've always taught people since the map module. Use your phone to geotag when you don't have a GPS because your phone has one. Um, and that's that's just a good way of getting shots that or getting location information without you having to manually um, figure out where to put or where to put them on the map. Uh, does Lightroom track the data on when the photo was taken? If so, dragging the photo to the location will affect the time. No, it does not affect the time data. It's just location. So it's just filling in those extra fields of GPS and city and time. It does not affect when the photo was taken time. That's a totally different field. So it does not uh, affect that at all. Um, now, while we're here, even though this isn't a beginner thing, there is one more way to use the map module and that is um, what's called a tr using a track log. Um, this is even going back before we would use a smartphone to do this. If there used to be little GPS things you could buy that didn't attach to the camera, you just turn it on and put it in your pocket or put it on your hat or wherever, walk around with it. And what it would do is every time you paused for more than a few seconds, a minute or whatever, it would log in the little device the GPS coordinates where you were, longitude and latitude. You move some more, pause, 
it would mark that spot. And so at the end of the day, when you came back, you plug this device into your computer, download the text log, and it would say, okay, this day and time, you were at these locations, or this coordinates. This day and time, you were at these coordinates. This day and time, you were at these coordinates. And so if you were shooting in your camera, date and time was accurate. In theory, everywhere you were when you took a shot that was in the little text log, your pictures would match because the date and time would match, the timestamp would match. So if you want it, you could use the Lightroom feature to bring in track logs and map photos that way. Now, again, not necessary anymore because we got smartphones, but here's the funny thing. There is an actual app or several apps actually. Uh, here, let me see if I can fire it up on my phone real quick. I'll show you, I'll at least tell you the name of the app. There's an app for, I use, I use an iPhone, so it's an iPhone app. I'm sure there's probably one for Android as well. It's called Geotag Photos. And Geotag Photos creates these logs. So instead of you having to remember to take your phone out every time you go somewhere and snap, Geotag Log would do it for you. It would just create this log that Lightroom can use. So you would start up the app. It would even tell you the exact time to set your camera to. Once you set your camera to that time, oops, sorry, you can't see it because it's all green. <laughs> it's greened out. Um, but you would set your time to the exact time of this app, wherever you are in the world. And you, 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 know, you can get out of the app because it works in the background. And once you start a log, you just go shooting. That way you don't have to remember to take your phone out each time. And then you get back home, you download or sync that log. I think it can sync to Dropbox. You sync it to Dropbox, you import it into uh, Lightroom, you import your photos in, you click the magic button, and it would auto-tag all your photos. And that's it. So that's pretty much every way to use the map that I can think of from a beginner standpoint. All right, next, let's go out of this. Let's see if I want to use these photos. Yeah, I can use these same ones. And um, let's go to the, uh, is it only, yes, we can see you flow and no, it is, it must be just you because I'm seeing other messages from other people. All right. So what I want to do now is uh, let's go to the map. No, I'm sorry. The book module, which is next. And as the name implies, the book module is for creating books, photo books, books that you would have printed. I don't have my portfolio book nearby. It's probably packed away somewhere. Um, but I, this is one of the ways I show my portfolio. I actually do it using a book that is printed from Lightroom. Uh, now, you can do these books a couple of different ways. There's a service tied to this. Um, called Blurb. It's a popular book service. And Blurb, um, hang on, if I do, yeah, you can either do, here are your choices. You can do Blurb, PDF, or JPEG. So if I do a Blurb book, that is a book that I'm uploading from Lightroom. They're printing out a physical book and shipping me a physical book. Or if I want to send it to somewhere else besides Blurb to print it, or I want to print it myself then I can make a PDF or JPEG of each page. Um, if you do blurb, you will then get pricing based on the number of things you put in your book, whether you do a standard landscape size, they have different sizes you can pick, they have different uh, hard, hard cover, soft cover, I usually do a hard cover image wrap for my, um, for my portfolio book. And then you can, of course, build a book based on this. So, for example, if I wanted to build a book of all these photos, the one thing I recommend, having done this before now, first arrange the collection in the order you want the images in. It will make so it will make it go so much faster if you arrange your collection first, because if you arrange your collection first, you can. Um, I think there's an auto. Yeah, there's an auto layout where it will take your entire collection and map and just lay out the whole book for you. Now, of course you can tweak it, but if the images aren't in the right order, you're gonna spend way more time tweaking it than it would have taken just to do it from scratch. Or you can do it from scratch. So for example, whatever I wanted to be on the cover, if I wanted that image to be on the cover, 
boom, that's the cover. If I wanted this image to be on the back cover, that's the back cover. So you can lay it out yourself manually just by dragging images into the book. Um, you can also choose various layouts. So I can say, well, for this one, I want the three photo layouts. And of course, they give you various versions of three photo layouts. So I want this one. And now I can say I want that photo in. I want this photo in. I want this photo in. And of course, you can go in. You can go to the page itself. You can add text, descriptions. You can do all kinds of stuff to lay out your book. Uh, once you get your 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 book laid out and you can even have this kind of layout where each one gives you a big box to do your description of, or tell your story about what went on in that photo. Uh, and the thing I like this, this is, this wasn't always here, but I love the fact that it tells me in the film strip here, how many times I've used each photo. So that lets me know whether or not I used a photo. And if I used it, if I used it once or more than once, uh, that wasn't always the case. <laughs> I remember early on that wasn't there. Because I would be like, did I use that photo? Oh, I can't remember what page that photo's on. And it would tell me. Um, and of course, you can add more pages. So uh, this will give you the estimated price for the book you've created. And if you go, depends on how many pages, obviously, you make, will determine the price and whether you do hardcover or softcover. So if I do softcover, uh, the price drops down. Now, Here's another thing that's uh, just been a blurb thing from day one. You see this, this watermark at the end? And it's not a watermark. It's like credits. It says at the very end on your last page, it will say design using Adobe Photoshop Lightroom with blurb. If you leave that on, the price of your book is cheaper. <laughs> if you turn that off, which you can turn it off, you can say, nope, don't do that. Don't do any advertising. I want the book not to have your logo on it then the price goes up. So it's up to you. You're, you're basically choosing whether or not you want a cheaper book with, a, with advertising. So it, it increases the price by six bucks in this case for this one book. That's totally up to you. But if you don't want any advertising, and, and I would give you the examples of when I use it, when I don't use it. If I'm doing a book for me, I don't care. I don't care if that's there on the last page. Who cares? If I'm doing a book for a client or a gift or something I'm giving away, or selling to a client, then I turn it off because I don't want them to think that even though they know I'm not printing books, I just don't want them to think he sent this off and had it printed. <laughs> so I don't want that to happen. So uh, I would turn it off and you can turn on page numbers. You can uh, increase the padding. You can change the font for the text. You can do all kinds of things to make your book as custom as it can be. Um, and again, if you, you don't want to use Blurb, you can, of course, choose PDF or JPEG to output all the pages and you do whatever you want to do with it at that point. Print it, put it online or whatever. Uh, speaking of times, do you set your time zone in your camera when you travel in order to take the local time on the picture? Absolutely. When I remember to do it. <laughs> so, uh, meaning, yes, I would always do it, but sometimes I do forget. And uh, speaking of which, by the way, if you forget. Let's say I went to Europe, which is a six hour difference in time for me. I did a shoot, came back and I was like, oh crap, I forgot to change the time on my camera. I get back and all the times are, are local time instead of the time where I actually was when I took the shot. You can, and I'm just gonna show this quickly. You can go in, and I don't remember where it is because I don't use it that often, but edit capture time under the metadata menu and you can change it. You can adjust it to a specific time um, when or when w what would be the correct time. And this is, like I said, mainly if you just forgot to change your camera or your camera was on some weird time that never got set. So you can go in and tweak it or change it. Um, let's see. All right. Okay, I think I got everything else. And Victoria got that last question. So back to the book. Um, <clears throat> you can, as you can see, I was able to return back and continue editing. You can uh, keep working on the book. You can also save. Uh, let's see if I go down here. Uh, 
one or is it up? I thought there was a create book. Okay, if I say create book, there we go. So now what I've done is I've created a book, kind of like a book collection in the regular collection. So that way it, I don't have to always keep, remember, because remember I said sort the sort your collection in the order you want the pictures in. Well, this way I don't have to always keep that collection that way. I can go in and make one specifically for the book that I'm designing with the pictures in it that I want and make this as a saved thing that I can always come back to and edit without messing with my collection. So you can make these special collections for the various projects that you're working on. Sometimes they're called presets, sometimes they're called settings, sometimes they're called collections. Um, I think that's pretty much it, or templates. All right, so that's pretty much it. I think you kind of get the idea. You would just keep going, adding pages as needed. Um, that's my view. Okay, I want to go back to that view. And I can go ahead and add a, add a page. And I can rearrange the pages. I can add pages any way I want. And I can drag, should be able to drag and drop them around. And of course, I can dictate on each page um, what there will be. You know, for, so for example, there's some templates that are built in. Clean, creative, portfolio, travel, wedding. These are all standard um, presets that are built in for each page. Uh, two page spreads. Oh, the two page spreads is a nice one because what it literally allows you to do is put a, put a picture that's going to span across um, both pages. So for example, I can put this one in here and here, let's grab a different photo or we'll grab one of these. And then I can say that that will, and it will literally print that way. So when the person opens up to that two page spread, the whole photo goes across the spread. It really looks nice. So I've got a couple of those in my portfolio book as well. Um, so that's pretty much the book. Once you design it, once you lay it out, it's always giving you, by the way, I didn't notice this at first, but it's always giving you your price estimate up here. Uh, the more pages you add, the, the more expensive the book's going to get. And of course, depending on what cover you chose. So for example, um, I'll show you one more thing. Let's go to the image wrap. And for the cover, I'm gonna choose a different layout. Yeah, this is the one I've used before. So I've used this one before where it's kind of just like a mosaic of a bunch of pictures. And so here, if I, if I zoom into that, you'll be able to see what it's starting to look like. And you can literally go ahead and add in every little picture that you want. You can put text in or not. On, on mine, I think the only thing I put in here was um, port, the big word portfolio and Terry White Photography. That was it. So you can add in all these little uh, images from all the images that are going to be in the book. And I, I just, I don't know, I've always liked that cover idea. But of course, your cover is your cover. It's whatever you want it to be. Okay, so let's see here. Um, see if I missed anything on correct on quick questions. Yes, questions. Dun, 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 dun. So someone's asking about are there classes every day? I don't do classes every day, but there's someone streaming every day here at twitch.tv slash Adobe for about 17 to 18 hours a day. Um, <clears throat> so Victoria just put the times up. There's usually someone streaming. I, yeah, I never realized it's from 7 a.m. to 12 a.m. Pacific time every day, seven days a week. So you can always come here and watch something creative. All right. Uh, so that's the book module and books are cool. I, I don't do enough of them. What I'd love to get back to the habit of doing, and I was in this habit at, at once upon a time of every time I take a trip, come back home and make a book for that trip. And while we, of course, can post our pictures online, and we're going to get to that as we get to the web module, and you can do slideshows and other things, there's something about having your actual ph photography printed out that just, it just gives you a warm and fuzzy feeling on the inside when you're looking, when you're holding something in your hand, and you're able to flip through it and see the actual pictures nice and beautifully printed. 
Um, I've had a couple of blur books printed and the quality is outstanding. No issues with the quality whatsoever. It is time for me to update my portfolio book, but I, I want to do more of these books. Um, and I think there was one more thing, size. The other thing that's popular is this small, um, yeah, sure, change it, I don't care. This little small seven by seven inch or 18 by 18 centimeter <clears throat> uh, square book. Just a little book you can keep with you in your bag or backpack or purse or whatever. And just whip that out at any time and just flip through. And it just helps you convey your ideas, your what you are about, what your photography is about, or what the trip is about, whatever it is you're trying to convey. I highly recommend trying one of those little 7 by 7 inch books. Um, they are pretty cool. Okay, so that's the book thing. Send to blurb when you're all set. And please proofread it first because if you got a typo in it, they, they're not going to reprint it for free. Uh, so make sure all the pages have everything you want in them. Make sure that the text is all correct on every page that you added text to. Or you can export the book as a PDF. And that might be a good way to send it, give it to someone else as a PDF first to say, hey, look this over, proofread it for me. They get the PDF, email it to them. They can go through it, check it all, make sure it all is all spelled and grammar correct. And then you can hit print or send to blurb. And photos should be printed. Yes, I agree. Photos should be printed. Um, uh, behind this green screen are several of my photos on the wall. All my photos are all over my all over my uh, studio and my home. Uh, because I think photos should be printed. That's one another way to enjoy them. Not that I'm against online. I certainly put my share of photos online. But I think printed is another part of the story. Okay. So let's go into our next module, which is the slideshow module. And the slideshow module, kind of self-explanatory. It lets you do electronic slideshows from right within Lightroom. Um, the module has gotten some nice features along the way, especially in uh, about a year ago. Uh, the update included several adjustments or enhancements to the slideshow module. Um, and slideshows can be used in a couple of different ways. So let me let me just switch collections here just so we have something different to look at. I'm going to switch to my portfolio. Let's do nature and animals. Okay, we'll do nature and animals. All right, I'm not a nature or animal photographer, but every now and then I run across something cool that's nature and animals. <laughs> so I photograph it. All right, so here are some of my nature and animal photos. Um, and what I'd love to do now is talk about the slideshow. So if I go to the slideshow module, um, it will normally be on a default template. Let's see, I've got my templates here, and I'm going to go to the default one. All right, these are the ones you get by default. So if I click on simple, that's what you would see you would see uh, a black um, background to your images. The captions are on for like star ratings. Uh, if you use stars, you will see them there, which I don't see why I'd want that in the slideshow, but there it is as an option. And your images are not cropped, meaning you see the full boundary of your image, even though there may be black bars on the sides. Because you gotta remember, in most cases, you're presenting your slideshows on um, displays that are not the same aspect ratio as your camera. So normally your camera is more of a four by three aspect ratio um, and your slideshows or your monitor or your projector or your TV or whatever you're gonna display this on is 16 by nine. So you see how much wider the space is than the actual image. Now there is one called crop to fill and that means it will fill the entire screen with your image but you're going to crop some off so you, that's just the nature of aspect ratios so in this case could i use crop to fill and not care absolutely because the parts that are being cropped off i'm okay with um but i could certainly see in situations where crop to fill may not be a good choice depending on what you're doing all right so we've got who bugs 
So this would be a good example of when crop to fill would not work, at least for this photo. Uh, now I could move this one down. I think it will stick. But it just takes away something from that photo because you don't see the beauty of the long neck and everything else. But there's always a trade-off. You, either you want this to fill up the screen or you don't. Um, and if you don't, then you're going to see bars. If you do, then you're going to lose part of your image. That's just the way aspect ratios work. Okay. Um, yes, always make another person check the copy of your book because there, there, you will always forget things. I agree. All right, this was from South Africa, and that's a real lion about, oh, I don't know, 15, 20 feet away. <laughs> yeah, brings back memories. And these were taken in Toronto at the Butterfly House. Okay, so I see I'm getting lost in my own photos here. All right, so once you've chosen your photos, you can either choose one of these built-in presets or templates, or you can go over to the right-hand side. And this is the way, by the way, all of these modules work. On the left-hand side, if there are templates or presets or things you can save, they'll be on the left side. All the settings for that particular module will be on the right side. So in the book module, all the settings for the book were on the right-hand side. The font, the number of pages, the layouts, all that stuff's on the right. If I save it, it's on the left. Slideshow module, all the settings are on the right. If I create my own template or want to use one of their templates, it's on the left. So if we start at the top, this is where we choose the zoom to fill or not. Um, whether If you don't zoom to fill, whether or not you want it to cast a shadow, and casting a shadow wouldn't be very good in this case, but if I don't zoom to fill, do I want a border around the images? Um, and maybe that's okay. So just you can customize this to your heart's content. Do I want my identity plate to show somewhere on the photos? Uh, and again, <laughs> you get the Spider-Man effect, as Scott Kelby likes to refer to it. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, throws a web where he can. Okay, anyway, you get this, uh, <laughs> this, this, what this is designed to do is keep the ratio of your, of your, um, or your identity plate to that corner. So if I leave it there, it, that's the ratio, whether it's a portrait or landscape, it's going to keep it same ratio to that corner. Um, or not, it's up to you if you don't want your identity plate. Watermarking, um, you can have an actual watermark appear on the images. So if I say that I want the, um, oh, I don't see it here, but I'll choose one of mine. Uh, that will actually put my logo on every single picture. And for a slideshow, why would I need that on every single picture? I'm usually in control of it. Now, if I were exporting out a video, maybe. Uh, we're going to get to that in a second. Whether or not I want the star ratings, I don't ever know why I'd want that in the slideshow, but it's a choice. Uh, you can change your backdrop color, uh, color wash, make it a gradient, make it not. Um, you can actually put a background image in. So if you drag an image that you want to be in the background of all your photos, let's say that one. And this is, this is usually used a lot in weddings where they have the bride and groom photo in the background of all the photos. Um, I don't use it that often, but it's there. You can have an intro screen. So your first image of your slideshow when you play it is not your first image. It could be, uh, here I'll increase the identity plate. So it could be that instead. Um, and then it would go to the next, go to your first image. So intro screen, yes or no. And same thing, ending screen. So you could do the same thing, have an ending screen for your, and this could be a photo, this could be, no, it's an identity plate. So it's whatever you want your starting image and ending image to be. Uh, music, this is very important for slideshows. No one wants to see a slideshow in silence. All right, let me put it this way. No photographer should present their slides in silence. It's just not as impactful as having some background music to it. Um, now, what's changed here along the way, the, um, the slideshow has pretty much had back, background music from day one or for, for a long time. You can, of course, add a song, but now you get the choice to add... Um, why is it not letting me do that? 
you get the choice to add more than one song now. I'm not sure. Oh, it was turned off. Uh, you get the ability to add multiple songs. So these could be MP3s, M4As, um, whatever you have on your drive to, to want to add. Keep in mind that while you can add your own music and you can play it and enjoy it with your own music, that if you're going to post it somewhere, then you could be violating someone's copyright. So your music is, in, is for you to enjoy for you, but not for the world to enjoy that song that plays in the background of your music. So keep in mind, you if you want, want to post it, use royalty free. Can you mix them? Um, no. Oh, so let me go back to this. So now you have the ability of not only adding one song, you can add as many songs as you want and they will just play in order. Um, can you mix them? No, they don't mix. So it plays one right after another. Uh, now, this is pretty cool. This is fairly new. Uh, slideshow mode. So, for example, if I want to, and I, <laughs> I want to put a royalty, a non-royalty free song in there that I really like, but I can't because I'm going to post this episode as a video on demand later and I don't want it to be blocked. So I've got a royalty free song in here. Um, you know what, let me pick a different royalty free song though. I do have a better one. Uh, let me go to demo files and let me go to audio and let's see modern ambient maybe not that one same one not the right music all right, I think for this one, it's just going to, well, what's this? Yeah, that could be okay, but not this time. All right, so we'll just choose this one. And see how it added it in as another song that will play after that one? I'm just going to now get rid of this one. Okay, so now that I've got my music in place, uh, the next thing is whether or not I want it, the slideshow mode to be automatic or manual, meaning I'm going to advance the slides as I talk or it just plays. So automatic would be it just plays. Uh, this is what's fairly new. Right now, you can say fit to music. This was the way it used to be. And you could say, hey, if it's a four minute song and I'm playing 30 images, do the math, make each image stay on as long as it needs to stay on for the four minutes. Or I can say sync the slides to the music where it will try and um, determine the beat of the music and then switch to the appropriate slide at the appropriate time based on the beat. So as the beats hit, the slides will change. Um, I've had mixed results with that, depends on the song. All right, audio balance. Now this is video versus music. Because slideshows can contain videos too, because you can bring videos into Lightroom. So let's say you were out shooting these butterflies and you also did a video of the butterflies flying around. You could bring that video in and make it part of the slideshow. Now, if that video has audio, what do you want to hear? What do you want to be dominant? So that's what this slider is for. Do you want the audio from the video to be dominant? That's what it defaults to. It kind of leans towards that. Or do you want the music to still remain dominant? And it will, you would lean towards that. If you go all the way, then it would mute one or the other. So for example, if I went all the way over to video, when that video plays, it would mute the background music until the video is done then it will go back to playing the music. Um, this is fairly new as well, pan and zoom, which I like this actually, to where it will pan and zoom the photos, commonly referred to as like a Ken Burns effect. I don't want to repeat it. And I want the quality could be standard, draft, or high. Um, so I can preview this. All right, you get the idea. If you like it, uh, then you can actually, hang on, sorry, I didn't want to do it again. <laughs> where's my, oh, there it is. I was gonna say, where's my pause or stop button? Um, 
if you, um, what was I going to say? If you're happy with the quality of it, then you can also preview plays it in the window that we're seeing now. Play will play it full screen. I'm, I'm reluctant to play it full screen because depending on the hookup and the video connections I've got, I've sometimes seen full screen crash Lightroom. That's why I'm hesitant to do it in this particular setup. But I'll test it one time if it crashes, I warned you. Um, and, or, and, and by the way, playing it means you're ready to play it in front of your big grand audience and you're ready to go. Or you could say export it out as a video. If I say export it out as a video, it can make an HD version of my video with the music and everything included uh, as a movie that I can then host or play or put wherever I want. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and try and play it full screen. We'll see what happens. All right, it's working. And then you just hit escape to get out of it. So if I go back to the beginning, try it again. All right. So you get the idea. Now, once I'm happy with it, I got a couple of choices. Obviously, just play it in front of my audience live. The other choice, export it out as an HD movie. Then I can do whatever I want with the movie. Third choice is I like all of this setup that I did just now, and I don't want to have to remember, make the border this color, this size, this background, blah, blah, blah. That's why we make a template. So I can say from now on, whenever I want to present any images using these settings, I can call this my Twitch slideshow and that will be saved in, in the user template. So now if I were to choose a different collection, let's say that I want to go, go to, uh, dun, 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 dun. Uh, we'll go back to this. We'll go back to the world traveler and now those are in the same setup. So if I preview this, It'll have to build. Now, what it's doing is it's building the quality of the images as, as previews for the slideshow. And that just helps the slideshow go faster once it's actually playing. So it doesn't have to build them on the fly. Um, so it's, it's, I'd rather have the progress bar up front before it shows, and then it shows. So there's the panning and zooming happening. And again, now that I have this template, I can use that template for any collection or any photos I want. Now, what if you don't want to play all the photos in a particular collection? What if you want to pick and choose? Maybe I want a slideshow of just the landscape ones instead of the portrait. Oh, hang on. Sorry, I didn't mean to hit play. Uh, so I'll go back to this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. I'm holding down my command key on Mac, control key on Windows. And now I've selected just the landscape images I want. Notice right here, and you'll see this in most of the modules from here on out, use all film strip photos or selected photos. So now it's just going to use just the ones I selected for my slideshow. So if I preview that, it's only using those. Skipping over Big Ben, going to the cannons. Skipping over the towers, going to the boat. So that way, you don't have to use every single photo in a folder or collection. You can pick and choose which ones you want to display, uh, print, or use web. Because all of these features from here on out are the same. So just remember that's sticky. So if all of a sudden you're not getting everything you want it, remember to switch it back to all. Okay. Uh, I think I got everything I wanted. All right, let's go now on to print. And this will be nice because it'll tie right into our output um, segment, which is starting five minutes ago. <laughs> okay, so let's again go to the to the uh, basic ones that come built into Lightroom. So the print module is one of the most powerful modules in Lightroom. It's also also one of the ones that's often overlooked because most of us are just used to using Lightroom and posting our images online. 
We never think about using the print module because most of us probably aren't doing our own prints even when we are printing. But keep in mind, the print module isn't just for printing directly to a printer. And I'll explain that in just a minute. Um, and hello there, the person that just came into the chat who I can't really see or pronounce your, your, your handle, but hello. All right, so you have some Lightroom templates just like we had for the slideshow module. You've got some for the book module. So for example, if I just want to make an 8x10, there it is, boom, an 8x10 of my photos. Can I then go in and do all the things that we just talked about before, make it borderless, rotate to fit, not change the margins? Yep, you can go. Now we're looking at all the settings for prints. You can go in and choose all these different settings to do it any way you want. Now what's cool about the, um, the print module is it works in one of three modes. You've got single image, picture package, and custom package. What's the difference? Let's say that I pick um, four images. I'll pick, the, I'll pick four that I haven't used yet, these four. Well, right now, if I were to hit print and it went to a printer, I'd get four 8x10s. I'd get that one, that one, that one, and that one. Now, keep in mind, let's say you look at that and you don't like the crop. You can go in and pull these around and adjust them before you print. So I would say look at them like this beforehand and make sure that nothing important is being cropped off for the size that you picked. And then now once you've got it set, you can hit print and they would print out that way. Um, that's great. And if I choose a layout that includes more than one picture, then I will get, um, in this case, hang on, sorry, sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Undo. Let's say I pick a layout because these are all presets. So I don't want to use these. I want to show you a different way. So let's say I, I do, um, instead of one or page grid, instead of one row and one column, which is what we have now, I have two columns. So now I'm going to get one picture on one side, one picture on the other side. So that's one page and I'm going to get the second page. So you can design this and customize it any way you want. If I want all four on here at the same time, then I get that. So that's the single image contact sheet way of doing it. And what that means by single image, you'll get a single image per page or a single image per square or per placeholder. Um, now, what's the difference between that and picture package? Picture package, on the other hand, says, I want to print one picture up multiple ways. So, for example, I want to, um, here, we'll clear the layout. Uh, and this is so cool. I want a 5x7. I want a 2x2x2.5x3.5. Two by, two by I want a 4x6. I want an 8x10. I want um, another 5x7. And see what it's doing? It's automatically making all of those sizes fit on my default sheet of paper size. If I have a bigger sheet of paper, then it'll put more pictures on that bigger sheet of paper. Right now, I think it's probably defaulting to 8.5 by 11, and it is. I'm looking at the rulers here. So 8.5 by 11, standard U.S. size. If I had A4 chosen as my page setup, or if I had tabloid or any other bigger size chosen, then I would be able to get more pictures up on the page. But what the, what's cool about this is I'm getting to pick all the different sizes I want for print. And this is kind of cool especially for people doing their own prints or even sending them off to a service. If I'm, sent, if I'm doing my own prints and I want um, this, you know, I want two five by sevens. Here, let's do two more five by sevens. Well then why, why have to go and buy the special five by seven paper if I can print them two up on a page and just cut it. So the, the two five by seven pages is great for people that don't want to cut their own pictures. But this way, I'm using one sheet of paper to get as many pictures on it as will fit. And it's doing that figuring out what will fit for me. So if I want some wallets, look at how it's doing that. It's putting the wallets up on the page, turning them if it has to, to make as many fit to take advantage of your paper. So that's picture package versus single image contact sheet. All right, next one up is custom package. And custom is, you're, you do it any way you want. You can add from a picture package, you can do, so you can mix and match. You can say, 
I want to do um, some that are repeated, some that aren't repeated. I can do it any way that I want to do it. So I can do um, this one, this one, this one. And now I can put whatever pictures in there I want. So I want that one in there. I want that one in there. But I also want, and it didn't space that one out properly, but I also want that one in there as well. So I can, yeah, that one didn't get done right. Let's clear the layout one more time. Let's try that again. So I do two five by sevens. Okay, so the two five by sevens could be the same or they could be different. So that's what custom lets me do. Um, and again, you still have the ability, if it didn't map to the proper aspect ratio, you still have the ability to move it around in the, in the frame. Okay, so now that we know what each one is for, and each one does, and what these are for, you notice that Lightroom gives you some templates. Just like it gives you templates for slideshow, it gives you templates for print and web as well. So I can say, hey, give me one 4x6. Give me a 4x6 and six 2x3s. Give me a 5x7. Give me a 5x7 that way, or 7x5, and all of those. So if you don't want to design it yourself, they're already built in. There are a lot that are already here. And then as we go in, there are some different ones for different purposes. Now keep in mind, and these are for like contact sheets, where I want to use a bunch of pictures and print them out as, contact, as a contact sheet instead, where it will actually put the title in. And you can add all of those kinds of things in as well. So if you want to put in the photo info and, and make that be the file name, that's just a checkbox away. You don't have to type that in. Uh, five by eight contact sheet, landscape, so forth and so on. All right. Uh, triptych. Now, you'll notice that those are the custom ones. Those are the ones you get. Those are the ones that are already built into your Lightroom. And then I've got my own folder. I've got Scott's folder too, but I've got my own folder. Because you can make some pretty interesting layouts that aren't really standard for printing, but are good for other things. So for example, um, let's see, there's one I just saw. I use this one a lot. Where I want to make an eight by standard 8x10, but I want it to be on a black background. And I want it to uh, have three images up at the same time. And I might actually print that and put it in a frame just like that with my watermark or whatever on the bottom or not. So totally up to you. You can take that off and make these taller if you want. Uh, let's see. Here's another one. Four, four up on a 16 by 20. Four up that way. So if, again, if you can print these different custom sizes, great. You can have your own. Um, I used to have one called Studio Print. This is one where I would actually give it some white space around it to make it look like it were matted when I stick it in a regular 16 by 20 frame. Uh, studio print on black. Where again, it's really not for a wide picture. That one's more for a tall picture. Um, and then I had some for canvas prints. 16 by 20 canvas print. 20 by 30 studio print. That will go in a frame. This one will go on canvas. So... I'm not printing any of these on my own printer. I'm sending them to print houses, whether it be Mpix or Costco, anywhere that I want to send stuff to have it printed. I'm using Lightroom to generate the files because Lightroom does this faster and easier than anything else. Hands down, faster than Photoshop. You know how much time it would take me to go in and customize all this and get this all ready for multiple photos in Photoshop? several minutes if not hours whereas here it's all just a click away i can go ahead and click photos which ones i want what sizes i want presets done output gone so now when i say output and i say that people ignore the print module if they're not printing their own pictures because you think print oh i don't even have a printer I'm not, i don't even have a photo printer i'm not going to ever use that but here's the hidden benefit to the print module normally you're right it defaults to printing to a printer and if you don't have a printer, then that's not really of much use to you. But know that you can change this from printer to JPEG file. So now any of these layouts that you just created and took advantage of, 
you can actually output this as a JPEG file and use it either on a, as a, to send it to a print service to have the print print it or use it online or use it any way you want. So for example, if I go back to, uh, let's see, if I go back to this one and let's pick some nice photos. Let's pick this one, this one, and this one. And I get those photos printed, or get them set up the way I want. Let's move that one over just a little bit. That one's good. We'll move this one over just a little bit. And I get them set up the way I want. Well, I, I don't want to print that on a printer. I want to post that on Instagram. I want to post that on uh, Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Oh, wait, social media? Yeah. Print to file. And you can choose your resolution. You can choose whether it's going to do any sharpening or not. You can choose your JPEG quality. You can change any custom dimensions about it you want. You can choose what color space it's going to use. So I would use sRGB for online versus Adobe uh, RGB for print or Pro Photo for print. Uh, so now I'll go ahead and click print to file. It will then come up and say, where do you want this? I want it on a desktop and I want to call it New York 2SF. All right, desktop, save. And it's creating a JPEG file based on this layout and printing it or saving it out in the background. So I can keep working because that's a background process. So if I want to pick three more while I'm waiting for that first one, I can go ahead and say I want that one, this one, this one. Hang on. It's thinking. There we go. That one. And perhaps, see, I don't have a lot of portraits in this collection, but all right, that one. Whoa, 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 whoa! Don't you hate when it catches up to all the scrolling you were doing in the background? All right. Oh, cool, Paris. We got this one, and I saw another one. Let me do it manually. We'll go ahead and use the one from Russia. All right. So again, tweak it. Get it looking the way I want. And export out another one. I'll just call it World. And now that's making a JPEG of that one. Can I print PDF? Uh, no. This particular module is print to JPEG only. So you'd have to, um, now, uh, I take that back. You're right. If I click print to like a printer and my print driver has PDF in it, then yeah, you could do it that way. Can I do a quick explanation of the different RGB types and what they're for? Uh, sure. It's all about the amount of colors in the spectrum or color space. So sRGB is going to be your lowest denominator. It's the one that has the fewest colors in the color spectrum because it's, it, it, from what I remember, it, it was derived from an online use. So most people's computers back in the day didn't have all the colors that we have now. So sRGB is going to be your lowest common denominator. Adobe RGB from 1998, I think it was, uh, was a big color spectrum for printing because it had more colors in it than sRGB. And then Pro Photo is the biggest color spectrum. The the why I like to use Adobe RGB instead of Profoto for printing is because it depends on where I'm going with it. If I'm going, if I don't know where it's going to be printed, then I'll use Adobe RGB because that's a happy medium. It's going to have enough colors to make the photo look good, but it may not have all the colors of Profoto RGB. So Pro is going to have the most, Adobe in the middle for print, sRGB for online. That'd be the easiest way to remember. If you're if you're printing to a, a newer device then yeah, go for Pro Photo RGB. Even if you're printing to an older device, probably at this point it's probably still safe to go with Pro Photo RGB because it will just bring it down if it needs to. Um, sRGB is much better. Not for print, not in my opinion. Um, but anyway, sRGB is great for online, but not for print. I get much better results when I use Adobe RGB for prints. Okay. And again, it depends on the device and what the device is set up for. But in my personal experience, I've got better looking, closer looking prints uh, using uh, sRGB. I don't know where I sent that last one, but here's the one. And there's my JPEG file, sRGB ready to post online. So um, 
that's the print module and again all kinds of ways of of setting up the way your prints are going to look and they don't have to be prints you can print to a jpeg or use your print driver to print to a pdf or whatever you want so don't always think print module oh i don't have a printer can't use it you can last but not least here web and web is what you would expect. Web is making a web gallery. Um, and the web gallery is for online use. Now, I got to be honest with you. To me, this is more of a legacy feature of Lightroom. I'm covering it because it needs to be covered. But honestly, I don't use it. I don't use it anymore because there have been things that have replaced it already. Uh, we talked about one of those replacements already. In Lightroom Mobile, I can take any collection, click a button, sync to Lightroom Mobile, click another button, and say make public, and boom! I've got a URL to those photos that I can give to anyone, and they can look at them. Now, the downside to that to some people is that, well, it's hosted by Adobe, and it's an Adobe URL. I don't want them to go to that URL. I want them to go to my website. If you're that person, then this is for you. <laughs> if you're not that person and don't care and you want something fast and easy, then I would go the Lightroom Mobile route. What this allows me to do is, just like I said before, you've got templates. So now we're in the web module. We got web templates. These are all HTML5. There used to be a mix. There used to be HTML5 and Flash-based templates. All the Flash-based templates are long gone. So in Lightroom CC and Lightroom 6, there are no more Flash-based templates. They're all HTML5. But they're HTML5. They're not responsive. So that means that while these will work on a mobile device, they're not optimized for every screen size. In other words, what you see right now is what you get. It's not going to shrink down to a single column or two columns on a smaller screen. Uh, but you've got these templates to, to choose from. And these will just... It's the same pictures, it's just presenting them with different options. So you've got dark seed poppy, or dark, dark poppy seed, I should say. Um, dusk, and you know what? Just for the sake of time, see what, it's having to build it every time for 71 photos. So I don't need to build it for 71 photos for this example. Why don't we build it for just a few? That way it'll go a lot faster. Let's just do, oh, hold on. I thought I did it. There we go. We'll just do those. So now it's updating and it's just doing the selected photos. Okay, so now I can switch through these. Should happen faster because it's not having to do as many. But every time I do it, it's actually building HTML along the fly with those photos every single time. Uh, dusk, and you can click through these at your leisure, but these are all templates that uh, will give you a starting point for your online gallery. Uh, Exif metadata, which is kind of nice because what it will do is when you click on a photo, it would give you uh, the Exif data about that photo. Oh, hang on. Hold on. I clicked out of it by mistake. Sorry about that. So there, it's giving me all the Exif data about the photo if you needed that information. Now it's pulling that all in from the photo. So a lot of these will pull in your captions. They'll pull in your titles. Uh, that one pulls in your exit data. And normally, it, this would not say a world traveler, Terry White photographer. I typed that in earlier. Uh, so if you want to... Here, let's go back to the index. Oh, no, index, sorry. If you want it to say whatever you want it to say, you can either change it on the side, right? Oh, hang on, scroll up. Normally, you can... Oh, oh, there it is. You can change it right here for site title and collection title and collection description and contact name and your email address. Or you can actually click right here and change it. You can change these right in the module where they appear. Uh, so I can say contact name would be Terry White. And mail to... This is would be a mail link of where you want emails to be sent if someone clicked on it and you could delete that if you don't want an email link you don't have to put it in there so i'm going to say terry at email.com that's not a real address <laughs> all right just so you know all right so now we've got the email address in there and it will automatically limit this to nine pictures and then put the rest on the next page every single time 
And you can again go in and customize this to our content. So if you don't want, um, let's see where will it put that. Interesting. Some of them will change what's up here and put your identity plate in. I don't see where this one's putting it. Oh, there it is. Okay. So it'll put the identity plate up there or leave the title or both in this case. Uh, and again, any of these colors can be changed. So if you don't like the background color being that gray, then change it to a different color and that becomes your color for your background. You can change it to anything you want in the spectrum. Um, so completely customizable. And once you get one customized the way you want, so that you would always have it again, plus sign, user template, web, twitch. And now I've created this template that will always be here every time I want to upload photos to the web. Now, what's the upload mean? Ooh, wait, hang on, hold on, hold on, grid pages. Dun, 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 dun. Is this new? This is new. It's a new interface for that. That's kind of cool. This is fairly new. This didn't used to be here as a, as a clickable thing. You, you could type in a number for how many cells you wanted across, how many, how many columns and rows you wanted. But now it's actually a nice grid that you can pick. That's kind of cool. You can also choose to show the cell numbers or not. So that's the one, two, three across here or not. Uh, image sizes for the pages, image width. So you can go in and create all of this. You can also do some watermarking. Uh, so I've got a simple watermark or I can use my logo. Since these are going to go on the web. And then once you're done setting this up the way you want, you can go in and either export this out as a folder of HTML. So it'll be ready to use, ready to edit, ready to do whatever you want to do with it. Or Lightroom has had a built-in FTP client since the web module has existed. So for many years, you could actually FTP or upload directly to your hosting provider um, right in Lightroom. So for example, I've got a domain called terrywhite.photography and terrywhitephotography.com, same site. I have a folder on that server called proofs because I normally use the proofs folder to put client proofs in, HTML galleries of their proofs. Um, I can use the FTP built into Lightroom to actually send this gallery to that folder right from here. Or I can export this folder out and then use another FTP client and upload it. Why would I use one or the other? The Lightroom FTP is slower. I'll be honest, it's slower. Uh, I use a program called Transmit. Transmit's much faster than Lightroom's built-in FTP. I don't know why Lightroom's FTP is as slow as it is, but it's slow. So even for the sake of time that it would take to do it, I'm gonna eliminate some of these photos, uh, drop it down to just a few. So it'll take less time for this as a demo. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna really drop it down. Let's make it just four. And since we're only doing four, we can make our grid Okay, so nine is as small as it gets. And we'll make our grid that. And now I'm gonna go ahead and say, upload this to a folder called, um, a subfolder in my proofs folder. We'll call it, we'll probably call it Twitch. All right, let's just call it Twitch. So now it'll be terrywhite.com or terrywhite.photography slash proofs slash Twitch when this is done. So upload. And now the, the thing I like about having it built in is it's built in. I can do it right from here. I don't have to do anything else. I don't have to export out a folder, find a folder, log in with an FTP client, so forth and so on. It will just do it all right here. Um, the downside is it's slower, but it is happening in the background. So we don't have to wait for it. You can go and do other things while that's happening. You can move to a different module, continue working in Lightroom while that's going on in the background. And we will do just that. <laughs> so we'll let that cook. It shouldn't take too much longer, but just know that you have the option to export directly from Lightroom to a web folder, 
do whatever you want with that folder of HTML or upload it directly to a hosting provider at your own domain, your own hosting, has nothing to do with hosting with Adobe. Um, the question that normally comes up at this point is can it be password protected? Not built in from Lightroom. So if you've got some other way to password protect it, you can. All right. Um, it looks like that's done. So I can, I don't have to move on. I can actually just show you. All right. So it's finished. Let's go out of this. Let's create a, a new um, page here, real quick. Terry White, actually, dot photography slash proofs slash twitch. It is case sensitive. So always remember that if you use the capital T in your folder name, then it's it it won't work with a lowercase t. It's got to be the same exact what you typed in for Lightroom. So once I go here, um, that gallery is now live on the web. So I can give anyone that URL and they would be able to go to my site, go to that folder with those images and navigate them and go to the next one and go to the next one. And my watermark is on each one because I told it to do that and there they are that's what the web module is for all right echo sith um i it wasn't my contest so i don't know when you'll receive your um your winnings i don't control any of that um I'm trying to think even who would you contact about it. Uh, I think that was probably during Michael Chase's stream. So I would reach out to Michael Chase and ask him that question. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have any control or can tell you anything about your winnings. Okay. Uh, but you should have received at least the Creative Cloud by now. Okay, so that's the web module. That's what it's for. Let's switch back to Lightroom. And now let's talk about output. We got 33 minutes. I want to talk about two things that are very important. Outputting your, yep, M. Chase, that's the guy. Um, I want to talk about outputting your photos for email, print, web, and moving your photos to archive them onto a different drive. All right. Um, so first and foremost, Lightroom already has the ability built in to create an email for of your photos. So for example, let's say I want to email, um, I don't know, you can pick one or more. So let's say I want to pick that one and this one. So I want to email those two photos to somebody. Well, these are big PSDs and raw files. I don't want to email them the raw files. I want it to make a JPEG for me on the fly. So a lot of people don't realize that under the file menu, You've got email photos. It's right there. It's a choice built right into Lightroom. A lot of people export it and then go attach it to an email separately when you can actually do all of this right, right here. So if I say email photos, now you, you would think, oh, I got to know their email address. It's in my email program. I don't know it by heart. That's okay. You can leave it blank. <laughs> you can just, you don't, if you know it, great. But if you don't know it, you don't have to. So if I knew it, I can say this is going to terry at email.com, which is not a real address. And then it would already be addressed. If I don't know it, just leave it blank. Subject. Uh, the subject is going to be, uh, look at my pictures. All right. Now, where is it going to do it from? You have a choice of... Using, in my case, I'm on a, on a Mac, so I can use Apple Mail, which is my email program. And what this will do is it will create an email with those pictures and launch Apple Mail and attach them and be ready to go with that subject and whoever I addressed it to. So that's what I love about that is it's all built in from here. I don't have to worry about exporting them, finding them later, attaching them to the email. It will walk through that entire process. Now, how is it going, what size is it going to make them? Notice that there's a preset or presets here. The small, medium, large, and full size are built in. These are the ones that came with Lightroom. I made one called email for web. Now, the ones that are built in, they tell you what they are. 300 pixels on the longest edge, 500 pixels on the longest edge, which medium quality, 
800 pixels on the longest edge with high quality or original size, very high quality. It'll still be a JPEG, but meaning that it will be the original size of dimensions of the photo. So if it's 5,000 by 3,000, that's what it will be. Um, I made one called email or for email, which will actually make it whatever size I picked at the time. Um, and it will uh, put my watermark on it. So you can, you can create your own preset right here. And this way, it's for email, and you can do everything you want it to do. So, for example, I can say, yes, I want it sRGB. I want it a little bit higher quality. I want it to be 1024 on the longest edge. I want it to be uh, down sample to 72 pixels per inch. I only want to include the copyright info and the metadata, and I want it to watermark it as well. Or not. Your choice. And then I can save that preset, and that way I'll always be able to use it. So I can say, say that this is for Twitch email. I'm naming these all Twitch so I can delete them later. <laughs> I'll know which ones are which. Email. All right. So I'll create, I'll create that preset, export out, and now that one is ready to go. For Twitch email with all of those settings, I never have to remember those settings again. And if I were to click Send... It would make the two JPEGs for me, fire up my email program, create a new message, put the subject in, attach those two photos, and all I'd have to do is address it and put whatever else I want to put into it. And away it goes. Hit send. So that's emailing directly from Lightroom, built right in. What if you want to upload them? Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, iMessage. Snap, you know, Snapchat's a little more difficult. Uh, whatever else, whatever <laughs> other way you want to use the photos. Then that's where export comes in. So same two photos. I'll just leave them selected for ease of example. File, export. Now you notice you've got export with previous, meaning use the previous settings that I used last time. Export with a preset. I've got lots of presets. Or just hit export and then I can choose everything every single time. Now remember, it will be sticky. It remembers the last thing I used. So in this case, I want to export to the hard drive. I want to put them in a particular place in the in, in the hard drive. Um, on the desktop, I mean, for Twitch demo. So I'm telling it to put them in a subfolder on the desktop called for Twitch demo. I can rename them if I want to, or just leave them. They'll have the exact file names they had on them from the beginning. I can choose whether or not they're going to be JPEGs, PSDs, TIFFs, RAW files, or the original, whatever they are. I can choose whatever color space. We talked about this earlier. So if I'm usually, if I'm doing it for web, I'll do sRGB. If I'm doing them to give them to a client to print them out, then I'm going to do Adobe RGB. Um, again, size, quality, size and quality are up to me. So for, let's say I'm going to use one for, let's make this one for Instagram. Well, Instagram recommends that your photo not be any longer than 10, 1080 pixels on the longest dimension. Um, quality, up to you. Facebook, on the other hand, you probably want the quality to be as high as possible because Facebook is going to degrade it quite a bit. Uh, so that's up to you. Include metadata. Well, I want to include um, all metadata. And then I get a choice if I want to keep it private, remove any people tags or remove any location information. This is actually location information I want to brag about. So I would leave that in. But if there were people I wanted to remain private, meaning don't put their names in it, don't put their names in it. All right. Um, watermark them or not, your choice. And after it's done, this is a very important thing. When it's done, what do you want it to do? I want it to show them to me. That way, that makes it easier for me to find them later when I'm ready to use them. So show them to me in the finder. You can also uh, have them open up in another application, or you can have them execute by another application. These are all actually all Lightroom drop. I'm sorry, Photoshop droplets. So I can have it go to those as droplets. And if you want to put your own actions in, you can say go to um, go to the export actions folder. And in the export actions folder, it will let you drop in anything you want to appear in that menu. So I put in three uh, Photoshop droplet or basically actions that I could choose from as well. So just show them to me in the finder and away we go. So now it's going to do the export. 
it's doing it. Exporting two photos, making my JPEGs that are no bigger than 1080 pixels on the longest dimensions. And when it's done, boom, takes me to that folder. There they are. And they're watermarked, as I told it to do. So both are putting the watermarks in the same exact spot because that's the way the watermark is set up. And now I've got two JPEGs that are no bigger than 1080 pixels on the longest dimension that I can now upload to wherever I want to upload them to. Now, uh, I mentioned um, Instagram. Instagram right now, and has been since day one, only allows you to post from your phone, from your app. So in this case, would I really use this for Instagram? Probably not, because then I'd have to now get them from here on my computer back to my phone or on my phone to then be uploaded to Instagram. So what I, and you could do that with your Creative Cloud folder, with the Dropbox folder, you could do it with, um, what's the thing that hardly works? The uh, <laughs> AirDrop, you can do it with AirDrop. You can do it any way you want, email them to yourself, whatever you want to do to get them onto your phone. I just use Lightroom Mobile. That way they're already on my phone. And we talked about that when I showed Lightroom Mobile. If I want to upload or send two pictures over to Instagram. That's built into Lightroom Mobile. So I can do it that way. And um, there's even a watermark app that I showed and used last time. Okay, so that's exporting them out. And if I were going to do it for print, which I've already got an export preset set up, I'll just show it to you. Export for... Listen, actually, I don't, I don't say for print. I say to give it to a client, and they're going to print it. Then it would be this one, uh, trade for print, TFP. So put them in that TFP folder. Uh, this time we're going to make the JPEG, make them JPEGs. We're going to increase the or increase the color space to WRGB. Set the quality to seventy five percent. Yeah, I could probably go higher on that. Maybe make it a hundred because they're for print. Uh, no watermark in this case. Um, two hundred pixels per inch at three thousand by three thousand is usually good enough for most people to print. And that's it. So let me now. Since I made that change, I changed it from 75 to 100. Notice that my 4 TFP without water, without copyright is no longer highlighted because it doesn't match this anymore. If I switch it back, then it drops the quality back down. So let's say I want to increase the quality, but I want this now to be representative of that change. What I would then do is right click on this one and say update with current settings. Now it will be 100 from here on out every time I use it. So if I were to say export these, now it's making higher res JPEGs of my um, two photos and putting them in a different folder in a different location. Um, and then it will show it to me when it's done. And again, all these exports happen in the background so you can select your next, next set of pictures and go. All right. So let's say that that's my new one that no longer is it uh, watermarked and it is a higher resolution. So instead of being 300K, um, it's now 4.9 megabytes versus 3.9 megabytes versus 300K. And those are now um, ready to send to a client for print. So that's exporting. Uh, and again, your, you can make as many of the, as you can see, I've got a ton of export presets. You can make as many of those as you want. And next time you want to do it, instead of having to bring up the export menu and choose it, you just go export presets for um, Twitch email or for TFP without copyright or for web gallery without copyright or with copyright. I've got all of these presets ready to go. And I can just pick any one I want and export. And it will do whatever that export is set to do. Okay, so that was one. The next uh, big, uh, was one or two, the next big thing that's important is dealing with moving your images once you're done with them. So remember we did, we brought in the, um, the Gina folder at the very start of this broadcast. We brought in that from the other catalog. And here it is, the Gina J folder. Oh. Sorry, that's the wrong one. There it is. The Gina J folder. Okay, so it's got 25 photos in it that are now referenced here by Lightroom. They're in my hard drive, uh, in the pictures folder in my hard drive, and they're taking up whatever space they take up. At some point, I'm going to be done with these, meaning 
I'm done working on them. I've delivered, I've done my exports. I've delivered them to the client. The client's happy, signed off. I'm paid or not paid, but whatever. I, uh, the job's done. I don't need those 25 photos continuing to take up space here on my main drive. I'm on a laptop, limited space. I'm always going to have limited space on a laptop. So what I want to do is move them to a different drive where I've got more room. So in my, my normal case would be I would move them to this spot right here, my file server. I've got a file server that has terabytes and terabytes of space, 16 terabytes to, to be exact, um, terabytes and terabytes of space, and I've got plenty of room on there to grow, and I could always grow by adding bigger drives to it. It's a Drobo um, connected to a file server. So in this case, that's where they would normally go. But let's say you don't have a server. Let's say you don't have that. Let's say you just got one of these, a good old fashioned external drive. We're going to plug in this external drive and nothing's going to happen <laughs> because Lightroom only pays attention to drives that are been, that have been used by Lightroom. So I'm going to take this external drive, find my USB cable, which is sitting here. And I'm going to go ahead and plug in my external drive. And the light came on. And I hear it or feel it spinning up. It's one of those old fashioned non SSD drives. And once it spins up, nothing happens. Now, it's on the desktop. It's in, recognized by the operating system. If I go out to the desktop right now, there it is. G, G Drive B. That's what that drive is called. But there's nothing happening in Lightroom because Lightroom doesn't bother looking at things that Lightroom isn't using. So if it's not using the drive, why would it waste time looking at it? So this is one of the things that confuses users the most. And this is where most mishaps happen in Lightroom. This is where most people screw up their Lightroom catalogs. You know what they go do? They say, oh, I'm done with the Gina J folder. Let me get out of Lightroom, quit Lightroom or just jump out of it. Go find that, that folder here. There it is. And then they drag it to that external drive and then delete it from there. Yes. You can do that, but when you come back to Lightroom, then you've got to fix your problem because Lightroom is going to say, I don't know where the Gina J folders are, photos are anymore because you moved them behind my back. You took them away from me and now you've got to tell me where they are. So you're going to have uh, question marks or alert symbols or whatever the icon is these days that Lightroom uses on every single photo in that, that folder saying, I don't know where it is anymore. And luckily, it's it's not too hard to fix. You would click the little alert symbol. Um, here, I'll, I'll show you what it looks like. I'll just change the name of the folder. Another thing people muck around with. <laughs> they change the name of the folder to Gina JJ. So now I've changed the name. And since I've changed the name, that path is no longer valid. And now when I, uh, I'm going to have that little alert symbol right there. So that little alert symbol right there means that Lightroom can no longer find the photo it's missing so what I would have to do now you're probably thinking well how come you don't have that on all the photos because we built smart previews on all the rest we didn't build it on this one because this is the one we edited from uh, Photoshop so we haven't got a chance to build it yet but all the other ones have smart previews so the smart previews are still there you just don't have the original photo so I could not for example take this photo and edit it in Photoshop it's gonna be grayed out because Lightroom's saying, I don't know where that photo is. I can't edit it in Photoshop. I can't give you the high-res version. But I could use the develop module to make any other changes because we're using the Smart Preview. So long story short, the photo is missing, and I would need to reconnect them all. So when I click that alert symbol, I could then go find the new location, which would be the same folder now with a different name, and it would reconnect all the photos. But just, why are you, just don't do it that way. <laughs> Let me show you the way to do it. First, let's repair the problem. Let's put it back to the right name. Then that alert symbol should go away because the name has been updated. It should go away in just a second here. 
No, it's not going away. You've screwed it up forever now. Oh, see, and it's saying here this whole folder's still missing. Come on, you're not. Did I change it back to the right name? Yes, I did. Okay, I fixed it. All right, so the right name's there. It's now been fixed. No more missing photos. Let's do it the right way. How do we do it the right way? I want to move them to that external drive, and this is why most people probably do it outside of Lightroom, because the external drive doesn't show up. So here's the magic trick to make the external drive show up. And, it, and I agree. It shouldn't be this way. It should be easier. You should get a choice to say, when I plug in a drive, Lightroom should ask, do I want to use it? But you would get that every single time. All right. Anyway, in the meantime, we've been creating new collections by clicking the plus sign here. But you can also create folders. We've been using folders. We have never had to create one. We've just imported images already existing in existing folders. But the plus sign is here for a reason. If I say create a new folder, add folder, it will come up and ask me where. This is your chance to tell it about the new drive. If I go to the new drive and I create a new folder, I got one here that I did last time I showed this called Archive. We'll make a new folder called Twitch. So now when I create this new folder in that drive called Twitch and click Choose, lo and behold, the G drive is here. And there it is. And in here is a folder called Twitch with nothing in it. So now from here on out, Lightroom knows that that drive exists. It will, even though there's nothing on it that it knows about, it will show you this drive from here on out because you've introduced Lightroom to that drive by creating a folder on it that Lightroom knows about. Now here's your easy, easy, easy way of moving your photos from the internal drive or whatever drive you don't want them on anymore to the drive you want them on now and let Lightroom do all the work, no disconnected images, no need to move metadata, no need to fix problems. Here's the easiest way to do it. Take that folder, drag it into that folder. That's it. Moving folder, not copying, moving. So it's moving it from my internal drive, see them starting to disappear? All of these are being moved to my external drive. And once it's done, it's done. It knows where they are. I don't have to think about it anymore. And if I disconnect that drive, I still have the smart previews with me. All right. So now there it is, let's click. There's my Gina J folder in my new Twitch folder, in my external drive, and they're there. With everything, no problems, everything connected. It knows that there are the originals. It knows the smart previews are there. When I disconnect the drive, because I won't be taking that drive with me everywhere I go, it will be, I'll still have the smart previews. When I reconnect the drive, anything I did to the smart previews will apply to the raw files. The only thing I won't be able to do is if I disconnect the drive, I won't be able to edit in Photoshop or output a high, high, big, giant file. But that's it. The rest will just work. And as long as that drive's connected, I can do everything just as if those photos were on my internal drive. But now they're no longer taking up space. I just got rid of the space. Now, the only thing else that this broke, remember where these came from. These came from our old collection. I'm sorry, our old catalog. So that old Twitch catalog still thinks they're on the internal drive. So on the old catalog, if I go back and use that, I've got to tell it where these are now. Other than that, they've been moved the right way. And that's the way, you're, you're welcome, Renee. That's the way you need to do this from here on out to cause zero issues or have zero issues if you do it this way. If you do it behind Lightroom's back, that's okay as long as you know how to fix it. And some people, they say, oh, you know, experts. Oh, I do it all the time in the Finder or the OS because it's faster. I prefer 
to let it just do it in the background. Even though it might be faster to do the copy in the OS, I still got to come back and fix it after the fact. So I'd rather just, I'm in no hurry. <laughs> I'd rather just let it copy in the background while I continue working or moving in the background, I should say, and it'll just move. I don't have to think about it anymore. So that is the number one solution to the number one biggest problem I see of Lightroom users is they go outside of Lightroom and mess with the photos. If you don't ever go outside of Lightroom and mess with the folders or the photos, you won't have problems with Lightroom's catalog because Lightroom's catalog knows what it's doing. It knows where everything is. And all you have to do is drag and drop after you've introduced the drive to Lightroom. So now let's say I go outside of Lightroom and I just eject the drive because I'm about to take my laptop with me and I'm not taking this big giant external drive with me. All right, let's see it do it here. Is it going to do it? Okay, it's gone now. All right, and I didn't disconnect it yet, but when I come back here, see what happens? That drive is no longer green. It shows a missing folder, and it's grayed out, and everything is still here, and I still have access to the smart previews, except for that one I didn't build a smart preview for, but I didn't lose anything. And as soon, and for example, if I want to go here and I want to go into the develop module, even though I don't have that image with me anymore, and I pop over to the develop module for a second here, and I'm going to disconnect the drive while it's doing that. I still have access to it. I can still do something like bump up the exposure of that photo quite a bit, just so we see it. I can still work on it, even though I don't have it with me. So, and I can still also export, check this out, export with preset for web gallery with my watermark. Because while I was out and about, that model asked for this picture so she could post it on Facebook. And I can give it to her because this version of it is smaller than the smart preview. I wouldn't expose it that high, but you get the idea. So I can still give that photo out, even though I don't have that photo with me anymore. It's on a drive at home. When I get back home, Take the drive, reconnect it, the drive will spin up, ultimately it will connect to the uh, OS, and ultimately that should light back up, and it just did, and all is good in the world. I've got the original and the smart preview. And so I don't have to keep seeing the missing one for that one that we did in Photoshop. We're going to click on that one photo, and we're going to say previews. Build Smart Previews, yes, for that one photo. And now this one will have a Smart Preview as well. And there it is. It has a Smart Preview. I don't have to think about it anymore. So I got two minutes left in this stream before we bring up Molten Ink next. I have shown you in the last eight episodes, the last two being just now, everything I would tell a beginner who was sitting next to me, my friend beginner, this is all the things you need to know about Lightroom. Are there more things to know? Absolutely. There are lots more things to know or do or experiment or play with. But the basics that I've given you should help you along the way and get you going with Lightroom in the way that I think will be best for you and a way that I think will set you up for success in your photography and in managing your photos from here on out. So with that said, Thanks for watching this as a replay. Thanks for watching the video on demand. And also, more importantly, thanks for being live with me here today. We're about to hand it off to Molten Inc. If I don't see any more questions here.